Hi, class. Um, as promised, um, last week's video, actually this week's video, I talked about um, creating that I was going to create a lecture video for you on bell hooks opposite the oppositional gaze. And one of the reasons why I think that this piece of um, rhetoric is important is because in many ways, the two novels that, you know, again, you only have to choose one, but both novels that are an option are, I would argue, examples of the use of the oppositional gaze, right? It's the idea, if I were to try to put it into my own words, like what is the oppositional gaze? It's, it's a way of looking at things from a um, uh, underrepresented, uh, unprivileged, um, um, uh, you know, under-resourced um, community and or perspective. So, and again, I'm just kind of trying to, to, to put it into words so that you can see that it's important to take a term like the oppositional gaze and try to explain it into your own words. It'll make it easier when you begin to write about it in your final paper. So for example, um, the oppositional gaze, if you decide to pick um, Dreaming in Cuban by Christina Garcia, if that's the novel you, just, you choose, um, the most obvious example of the oppositional gaze is through the authorship, right? Who is telling the story? So if one of the focus um, that you wanna um, kind of tap into when you're writing this paper is to focus on who is telling the story, you can use this theory of the oppositional gaze to articulate why in a lot of ways, um, this is a more um, embraceive, holistic, or even subversive retelling of the uh, Cuban revolution. So historically, and I say his historically, right, H-I-S, um, you know, the Cuban revolution or most history books um, focus on a narrative that's told from a very dominant perspective. And then the way that we understand how, for example, a moment in history like the Cuban revolution uh, impacted a country, impacted a world, and impacted the people, sometimes that perspective of the people is excluded from that national or that nationalistic narrative. So I would argue that an example of the oppositional gaze um, in Dreaming in Cuban is not only in who is telling the story, but what stories or which stories are being told. If you haven't started the book, um, when you do, you'll learn that the role of the narrator is told from a um, matrilineal perspective, right? It's a multi-generational matrilineal perspective. And the perspective talks about um, the Cuban revolution, but through the perspective of the people, rather than the nationalistic or the national narrative of what, of what was happening uh, in the country and how it impacted the people or the Cuban people. So that's one example of how you can engage in the oppositional gaze, again, focusing on the who is telling the story, and then also focusing on how or which stories are being told. Now, um, Toni Morrison's Zula, which is the second novel, um, remember, you just have to pick one out of the two, it's your choice. So just as a quick um, kind of side note, Toni Morrison is actually um, my favorite author. I actually have a picture of her in my, um, in my living room. That's her and um, Angela Davis. But um, one of the things that I like about Zula is that, I mean, there's so many things, but one of the things that I like about Zula is the way that Toni Morrison talks about, um, you know, race and gender and economics by telling the story uh, through the storytelling of, of, of the women characters in her novel. And the story predominantly centers around Zula and her best friend, Ned. And in some ways, um, some of the ideas that pop up for me, I remember the first time I read the book, I was like, okay, I, I, I kind of see a trope, right? There was a trope between Zula and Ned 
kind of like the good girl and bad girl, right? But the way that Toni Morrison tells the story is she's recognizing gender roles. She's recognizing patriarchy. She's recognizing all of these elements that inform our behavior. Um, but I think she makes it a little bit more complex by also pointing out the hypocrisy. So one of the oppositional gaze messages that I took away from that book, and I've read it many, many times, and I always find something different. But one of the ways that I that I was like, oh, yeah, that's an example of an oppositional gaze is this idea that, you know, in a patriarchal society um, that um, constantly devalues women, um, you know, it doesn't really matter if you're a good girl, good girl, if you're a bad girl, right? That at the end of the day, it's a losing, it's a lose, lose battle, right? So in Zula, in the character of Zula, you end up seeing that she kind of sees that very clearly. So she decides to live her life however she wants to live it, um, kind of mirroring um, Ned, her best friend, who decides to live her life according to um, the expectations that are placed on her. And the ending of the book, I'm not gonna spoil it for you, but the ending of the book is kind of like a reminder, right? Of the importance of, you know, living your life the way you wanna live it, you know, living, you know, making sure that you're experiencing an authentic experience, that you're making the choices that are best for you. So I think that's another example of how the oppositional gaze is used, obviously, Toni Morrison, the who, right? Who is telling the story? It's important for you to do some background research um, to find out like who the author is and how their experiences and their identity um, impacts the way and the, and the why these stories are being told. And then obviously the next thing is why are these stories told, right? And what type of um, lessons value or uh, gains we can make from seeing things from a different perspective. I hope that makes sense. Um, and if it doesn't, you know, we can continue the conversation um, over office hours or, you know, on chat. It, it's, you know, let me know. I'm, I'm open to that. So what I want to do now is I would like to share screen and get you started on Bell Hooks's uh, article on the opposite or essay on the oppositional gaze. So this is something that um, you are required to read this week. Um, and you're not other than taking notes and 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 considering her ideas, right? Taking her ideas into consideration, um, you don't have to submit anything. And of course, if there's anything from this source or the source that you would want to use in your final paper, please feel free. I think this is a great, article that would really not only cover our understanding of the gays, but also talk about the value, right, um, that we get from, you know, uh, looking at history, right, his story through the, through the lens of her story, right. So um, I, I'm going to start, start you off and then I'll, I'll point out some things that stand out to me. And then um, I'm just going to go over like a few pieces, just, you know, just to help you think about it. So when thinking about black female spectators, I remember being punished as a child for staring for those hard, intense, direct looks children would give grownups, looks that were seen as confrontation, as confrontational, as gestures of resistance challenges to authority. To gaze has always been political in my life. Imagine the terror felt by the child who has come to understand through repeated punishments that one's gaze can be dangerous. To a child who has learned so well to look the other way when necessary. Yet when punished, the child is told by parents, look at me when I talk to you. Only the child is afraid to look, afraid to look, but fascinated by the gaze. There is power in looking. So pay close attention to, I believe it's sentence one, two, one, the second sentence where she says that to look is an act or a gesture of resistance. 
And another way of thinking about to look back is also to witness, right? And we've been talking about witness for a really long time, right? Like we see it in the news, we witness on social media. I think, you know, one of the things that we've been seeing more commonly now is you know, whether or not we're at the location, you know, whenever we've seen um, situations with police brutality, right, we have all become witnesses of the event, right? And what does witnessing and or looking back, what does that do for us, right? What does that do for our understanding of the story that's being told? So I'm going to keep going, okay? I'm just trying to help you make connections. And there's dozens of other ways of coming up with examples. I'm just giving you my example of like what I thought when I was reading this. Amazed the first time I read in history classes that white slave owners, men, women, and children punished enslaved black people for looking. I wondered how this traumatic relationship to the gays had informed black parenting and black spectatorship. Uh, to politics of, of slavery, of racialized power relations were such that the slaves were denied the right to gaze, connecting the strategy of domination to that used by grown folks in Southern black rural communities. Where I grew up, I was pained to think that there was no absolute difference between whites who had oppressed black people and ourselves. Years later, reading Michael Foucault, I thought again about these connections, about the ways power has domination, power as domination reproduces itself in different locations, employing similar apparatuses, strategies, and mechanisms of control. Since I knew as a child that the dominating power adults exercised over me and over my gaze, I was never so absolute that I did not dare to look, to sneak a peek, to state dangerously, to stare dangerously. I knew that the slaves had looked, that all attempts to repress our Black people's right to gaze had produced in us an overwhelming longing to look, a rebellious desire, an oppositional gaze. By courageously looking, we defiantly declared, not only will I stare, I want my look to change reality. So she is already embedding a definition of what it means not just to gaze, but to engage in the oppositional gaze. So um, Michael Foucault is someone that should have come up for you when you were reading psychoanalytic theory. He might come up again. No, he will come up again when you start reading post-colonial theory. Um, one of the greatest thinkers of modern society. And um, I want you to pay attention to how she is embedding the definition of what the oppositional gaze means. So let's, let's scroll back to what she says over here. Um, she says at the bottom of that paragraph, I thought again about these connections, about the ways power as domination reproduces itself in different locations. So an example, if we're thinking about dreaming in Cuban, right? Um, you know, the Cuban revolution, the way that it's been depicted um, has been that it was a win. You know, it's either depicted as it being a win for um, a, uh, a a, a country, you know, fighting for independence from colonialism, right? Uh, and in other ways, you know, the Cuban revolution has been depicted as something dangerous, as, as a, you know, Cuba for a long time suffered from the embargo, um, has been, their, the leaders have been depicted as, um, as uh, traitors or as dangerous, right? And the list goes on and on and on and on. One of the things that Dreaming in Cuban does is that it, that it makes all of those different narratives even more complex because we end up learning the way that the poor or women and children were left out of this, this amazing win, right? Nationalistic win that the island might have, that the island was experiencing. And in fact, um, there are many examples in Dreaming in Cuban where, um, 
you know, the most impoverished or the most powerless were um, abused by those who were supposed to liberate them. So here she's talking about that, right? How, how systems of domination end up kind of repeating itself and like, kind of like in a self-generating, um, it's like a self-generating uh, model and strategy, right? That even in a circumstance where there was a win and, you know, we were supposed to liberate the people, the, 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 the most powerless, like the people that needed the most help, the most representation were still victims of their own liberators, if that makes sense. I hope so. <laughs> so um, let me just read a little bit more. And then I'm sure like once I orient you, I know you'll read the rest and I'm sure that you'll do a much better job analyzing this. But I, again, I'm just thinking off the top of my head and hopefully that it'll kind of give you an idea of how you should be, how you can be processing this. Um, and then in this, in, par in, in page 116, you know, she says, right, that um, the opposite by courageously looking, we defiantly declare, not only will I stare, I want my look to change reality. So Toni Morrison and Christina Garcia, you can say that in them retelling these stories, right, that we learn about in history, that we learn in sociology books, that we learn from a national narrative, that in them telling these stories, they are engaging in a, 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 a rebellious or a, a rebellious act or in an act of resistance. Because instead of following the narrative that, you know, we are all kind of encouraged to digest, they're saying, uh-uh-uh, what about this? Have you considered this? Um, and they're using their authorship or, or, or their power of the gaze in order to communicate, in order to, to rebel, right, or to resist an imposed reality, right? Only one narrative told, only one story being told, or even a story, this, you know, oppositional stories between nations. It's just those two stories, but what about the people, right? Let me see. Even in the worst circumstances of domination, the ability to manipulate one's gaze in the face of structures of domination that would contain it opens up the possibility of agency, right? So in every moment of oppression, in every moment where someone is being dominated, there's also an opportunity, right, to break free. There's an opportunity to fight back. And there are so many different examples. You know, we read Allegory of the Cave at the beginning of the semester. We read um, A Doll's House, right? That for every situation where someone or people are being oppressed, right? Where they're being dominated, there's also an opportunity to resist, to rebel. In, in much of his work, Michael Foucault insists on describing domination in terms of relations of power as part of an effort to challenge the assumption that power is a system of domination which controls everything and which leaves no room for freedom, emphatically stating that in all relations of power, there is necessarily the possibility of resistance. He invites the critical thinker to search those margin gaps and locations on through the body where agency can be found, right? So for example, you know, Toni Morrison finds that agency by having these big conversations about race, gender, economics, poverty, right? Talking about these huge intersections of what it means to be an American and what it means to be a black American. Um, and she tells the story through this friendship right? These two young girls that meet at an early age and their friendship continues to the end of the book or their relationship continues to the end of the book. And again, in Christina Garcia's uh, Dreaming in Cuban, that's the ghost, <laughs> and Christina Garcia's Dreaming in Cuban, you know, she also finds like a little space, right? Look at what he says. He invites the critical thinker to search for those margins by telling the national history of Cuba and the liberation of Cuba. She is also choosing to tell that story through this matrilineal um, 
uh, storytelling, right? So it starts with the grandmother, then it's the sisters, and then it's the granddaughter. And you see that storytelling, right? We end up learning more and more and more about Cuban history and how not only uh, in, how imperialism and colonialism impacted the island um, before the revolution, during the revolution and after the revolution, but also how those new people, those new leaders, those liberators now in power also impacted, um, you know, the, the most oppressed and the most um, disenfranchised um, in the island as well. So making things very complex. And this 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 margins of resistance, right? We see it through how the writers are doing it, but also pay close attention to how the characters in the novels are doing it. So the authors are engaging in the margins, margins of resistance by writing these books, by telling the story and by telling a very nationalistic narrative through the eyes of the most oppressed or the most disenfranchised. But what are the characters doing and how are they telling the story? How are they um, exercising agency? How are they engaging in resistance and in rebellion by how they, what they choose to share and how their actions, how their um, beliefs inform their actions in the storyline. So there's so many different angles that you can come at um, when, when it comes to analyzing these two books. I, you know, really hope that, you know, us reading um, Laura Mulvey's Visual Pleasure, because um, I, you know, uh, uh, sex and power will come up in both of these two novels, right? How does power, how do power dynamics Rom romance and sex play, you know, what, what are their roles? How do they intersect in the novels? You can pay attention to that and you'll be able to use a lot of the analysis that Laura Mulvey provided in your earlier assignments. So um, I'm gonna leave it here because I don't wanna make the video so much longer, but um, you know, I'm, I'm obviously uh, uh, happy to um, if there's a particular page that you get stuck on, or if you want to talk about the article further, I have office hours, um, you know, feel free to reach out. But I think that if you read the oppositional gaze, and if you highlight the ideas similar to what I did with, with you right now, if you highlight the ideas that stand out to you, you'll be able to use or incorporate some of those claims into the analysis of the novel you decide to you decide to use for your final paper. Okay, I'm gonna send you guys this video um, this week. I'm gonna send you all this video this week. Um, and I would actually appreciate some feedback. I, I um, you know, sometimes I don't know if me kind of processing my thinking as I am engaging with you is helpful or if I need to do it a different way. Um, so any feedback would be greatly appreciated. Okay, I hope that this becomes helpful. And if there are, <clears throat> Any other lecture videos that I can make for you, you know, please let me know.